Well, hello everybody and welcome to Humanities 101 fully online using Canvas. So a few years ago in the Humanities Department, we began to see that our Humanities classes, some of our Humanities classes, were not filling when we were offering them in a face-to-face -face format. Uh, more, specific, more specifically, my Shakespeare class wasn't filling. So we thought, okay, what can we do to get students to sign up for the Shakespeare class? And we decided that, what if we offer it online, see what happens? Lo and behold, guess what happened? It filled up and overfilled. So ever since that time, we have been trying to migrate more of the humanities classes to a fully online format. And this last year, we decided to try our Humanities 101, which is the Introduction to Humanities class, to fully online. And I was elected to do that. The problem is when I teach my face-to-face -face class, what, I'm, what I was using primarily was the Sister Wendy videos on art to teach the students the different historical eras in art. And for those of you who don't know who Sister Wendy is, you'll have a short introduction to her in just a moment here. But since I wasn't a very techno-savvy person, and we were using another platform, um, <laughs> it became a difficulty for me to, to design the course. Well, once we migrated over to Canvas, and these types of issues became easier for me, again, a person who's not very technologically oriented, uh, it became possible to do it. So I spent all last summer deciding which part of the sister Wendy videos to put to use in my class. Part of the problem was that I couldn't break any copyright infringement laws. And that meant that I couldn't just ship the whole, all of the videos onto the class, which I would have loved to have done. Because in my face-to-face -face class, I used the entirety of the videos. And I then line up the assignments with those videos. And everything is just wonderful. Because Sister Wendy is wonderful. So I had to go through all the videos and decide which two or three or four minute segments highlighted the specifics of that particular historical era that I wanted to highlight, and then have paintings regarding that particular era and have assignments tuned into that. So that took quite a while, but I did it, and voila, now we have Sister Wendy videos. And so you see here on the course, or you will see in a moment here, that the course is designed, like many of your courses are designed, by weeks, and they are by historical eras. First you have the ancient world, then you have the Middle Ages, then we jump over to the Renaissance, uh, and so on and so forth. The really cool thing about going to a conference like this is that since this morning, I've attended more than one session where I've already learned that, okay, this is a pretty boring setup. And so I've had, some great, I've had some great examples of how to do it better and how to do it specifically better in Canvas. So next time, next year, this course is going to be ever so much more visually appealing because now I'm going to use all these fancy buttons and bells and whistles and so on and so forth. But this is the first time around, so here you have it. So what I wanted to do is I just wanted to show you just a one minute and 15 seconds <laughs> of Sister Wendy, um, because some of you are not familiar with her. Or I should ask, does everybody know who Sister Wendy is? Ah, four people, okay. Now, now you will know, here she is. She's this delightful art historian slash nun, or nun slash art historian, who talks about art specifically and within its historical context. So let's choose, oh, let's choose Middle Ages. Now here's where I'm hoping the sound will work. You realize that everybody in this picture is either pointing towards or looking at the least significant figure, young King Richard II, except for rather that dim angel at the back that hasn't sort of quite got the, got the idea. And the idea is a political idea. Because Richard was a disastrous king, poor lamb. He was handsome and, and brave, but he never kind of made it. He hadn't the charism that makes a leader. And all his life he had a struggle against the rejection by his people. 
For one thing, he didn't want to fight the French, which greatly upset the English. And at the end, okay, now I'm going to have to read go in. Okay, just bear with me one moment here as I go back into the chorus. But I just wanted you to get a flavor of Sister Wendy. So you can see why she's so engaging. She has all this commentary as she's teaching that is delightful. And then she's reviewing specific pieces of art, teaching the students how to view the art and the different elements of um, comp composition as well. Okay, so then the students view the, the Sister Wendy video clips and they engage with those clips by answering a discussion board. So for instance, the first week we do the ancient world, so the discussion board for that particular week, they're answering this question. After watching the video clip titled Vesuvius included in this week's module, consider Sister Wendy's commentary regarding the example of Roman art represented in the portrait of the baker and his wife. How does this piece of art contrast to the elements of Greek classicism and Hellenism presented in your textbook? What is your reaction to the portrait of the baker and his wife? How has Sister Wendy's commentary impacted your reaction to the piece? Okay, so I have three questions. Uh, one of the questions refers specifically back to the reading assignment for that week. The other question refers specifically to the clip. And so then their own involvement, their reaction. So you have all three elements going there in that, in that discussion board. And then they're reading each other's commentary as well. So now you know Sister Wendy. Isn't she delightful? So you can see why I really wanted to keep her as part of my course, because she's far more entertaining than I am. All right, another element in the face-to-face -face course that I wanted to make sure was in my online course was the uh, museum piece of it. So we usually go to at least two art museums, and we go as a class together. And I have one of the docents take us through the art museum and explain some of the pieces. Or, or I will speak uh, about some of the pieces, or I'll have one of our people from the art department come and talk about uh, certain pieces. And I didn't want to take that piece of the class out uh, because it's very interactive and it's you know, just very important to fulfilling one of the learning outcomes of the course, which is basically to develop a vocabulary for understanding and explaining art. That's one of the main um, learning objectives. So I thought, well, I'm going to have to also find material. And here I went to YouTube and found um, museum tours, which are great. And there's lots of them on there. So you have to be very specific to, to make sure they fit into the plan of the course. But there was also some videos that were specific to helping students to interpret, understand and interpret art and use the vocabulary that they're assigned to define in their textbook. So again, I have an assignment here. And within the assignment, the students are asked to view the three video clips of three different types of art analysis and apply those to a piece in their textbook. Now, these video clips aren't very long. I think the first one is called a des descriptive analysis. Oh, and it's about almost two minutes long, one minute and 53 seconds. The second one is a formal analysis, and it's two minutes and 12 seconds. The third one gives you a demonstration of interpretive analysis and it's about one minute and 15 seconds long. Now, the reason that I'm telling you how long these are is because you're going to watch these right now. And then you are going to apply the information the same as the students have to to another piece. So you're actually going to be students right now. Of course, I realize that many of you don't have all the background terminology and all that, but you're just going to fake it, right? Because we're all kind of good at that anyway. OK, so this first one, so you might want to take some notes if you want if you like to do that kind of stuff to help you do assignments. The first one is an example of descriptive analysis.
Imagine that you're in the Prado Museum in Spain looking at this gigantic painting by Francisco de Goya. The painting is 8 feet 9 inches by 13 feet 4 inches in length. The painting depicts an execution of masses of Spanish countrymen by the evading French army. There are eight soldiers with their faces turned away from the viewer. They're firing upon a central figure. The central figure is about 30 years old. He's on his knees. He's wearing a white shirt and yellow ochre pants. If you look closely at the palms of his hands, you'll see piercings. The central figure is surrounded by other men. One has his hands over his eyes. Another has his hands over his ears. Another in prayer. There's a long line of men that have been, are going to be executed. There's a monk. A monk is praying over these dead bodies. There's three dead bodies here. There's also a shadow of a woman. This would be the witnesses, the mothers, the daughters, the women that would be witnessing this event. You can see that the event takes place outside of the city. There's a church or cathedral in the background. There's a lantern that illuminates the scene. Okay, so that is an example of descriptive analysis, and basically it's very simple. What do you see? But for students who've never looked at a piece of art and don't really understand what do I want from a description, it's outlining those basic things that you do when you do a description. Okay, the next one is a formal analysis of the same painting. And again, this is about 2 minutes and 12 seconds. Pardon me? Go ahead. In the formal analysis, we explore the elements of composition, line, te texture, space, color, and shape. I like to ask myself, what is the mood of the painting? In this painting, the mood is very bleak and somber. The colors which the artist has chosen are earth tones, and there is a strong overall contrast of dark and light. This dramatic dark and light effect is called chiaroscuro and can be seen in the central figure with the outstretched arms. He is our focal point. The implied lines of the guns lead us, or the rifles lead us, to that central figure. The line is reiterated in the collar and the pants of the man. You can also see that line on the ground formed by the light of the lantern. There is a line in the sand of good and evil. The shapes of the French soldiers are highly contoured. They almost look like paper cutouts. They turn away from the viewer. We don't know what they look like, but we can see into the faces of the Spanish countrymen. We can see the fear. We can see hope. We can see various emotions. If you look at the texture, the Spanish countrymen have a softer texture. There's a slickness, a shininess to the French soldiers, whereas there's a softer more subdued texture in the Spanish countrymen. Spatially, the viewer is looking from the outside in. We could actually be giving the orders, or we're a spectator. Okay, so obviously the formal description is going to do with the elements of composition, and the students by this time have had several assignments that ask them to look at the definitions of formal of the basic um, elements of fiction. The last one is the interpretive analysis. It's a, this is the shortest one. Okay, Christopher, how did you do that? It's this one?
The interpretation is your own subjective view of what is going on in the painting. What does it say to you personally? As I look at this painting without even knowing the history behind it, I feel empathy with the Spanish countrymen. The central figure appears to be a Christ-like figure. Spain and France are for the most part Catholic, and there would be no greater hero than Christ. He appears on the scene bigger than life. Imagine if he stood up, he would tower over the scene. A soft light reflects behind him, creating a feeling of spirituality. It is though he is asking the soldiers, why are you doing this to me? He stands with the Spanish people and symbolizes their courage, faith, and lack of understanding of the war atrocities and the aggression felt by the French invasion. The element of time is very interesting in this painting. Goya presents the present, the figures presently being shot, the past, the dead men in the pool of blood, and the future, the long line of men who will be shot. The painting is timeless. It pays tribute to people who are willing to stand up for their beliefs in spite of aggressors who would try to destroy them. It also shows the price that the aggressors paid as well as the victims. We see that the aggressors, the French army, have become robotic-like and inhumane in their treatment of the people that they would have tried to conquer. We can relate to the people that are being shot and are standing up for their rights and what they believe in. We see the human emotions as they go to their death. Okay. So now you're ready to do this assignment, right? So just in case you didn't take notes, Oh, that's going to be right in front. Okay. I know this is hard to see, but these boards are so little. But there's also one right there. So um, the first three rows here, you students here, are going to write up a descriptive analysis of the painting that I'm going to put up on the board. Uh, the rest of the rows back here on this side, you're going to do a formal analysis. So red shirt on back, formal analysis. Okay, and then from here on back, you're going to do an interpretive analysis of the painting that I'm going to put up. So take the next five minutes to write up a paragraph of your assigned analysis, and then we'll be sharing that. Okay, are we good to go here? So I would like somebody to read their descriptive analysis. May I have a volunteer from somebody from the descriptive group? We described the fact that there's a lady in the landscape. It's probably springtime. Uh, she seemed relaxed. Um, they're muted colors. She's dressed. Um, she has a parasol and a, and a sun hat, and uh, we couldn't decide what she was looking at, but she was either just relaxing or looking at some, some scene that we can't see. Um, and then some people in the group was describing the tree as poplar tree, mm -hmm. maybe. Uh, we talked about the possibility of there being wind or something because of the texture of the grass. And um, it's a very defined horizon line, bluish in the back. We were, I was wondering, a couple of us were wondering what that square on the left end tree in the middle of the tree was. I don't know. Thank you. Yeah. Very nice. <laughs> Great. Great. Now I'm looking for a formal analysis. Can somebody offer that? Thank you. So I said there was a ton of open space, several wispy trees, and a light leaf structure. It was very light spring colors, green, blues, lavender, periwinkle maybe. The texture of the painting looks uh, muddy. The, the colors and the objects are blended. The woman in the foreground balances the three trees in the mid-range, but the left side feels very open. There's lots of vertical lines balanced by two horizontal lines and a horizontal band that's sort of purpley flowers in the meadow in the front. Um, and the mood is light and cheery. 
Sister Wendy now has competition. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, and inter an interpretive analysis. These, of course, are very individual. So. <laughs> this is an image of a woman walking in the summer. She appears to be integrated into the scenery, blending into the flowers, as if she were the stem with her parasol as the flower, a large bloom in a, the field of smaller flowers. You can feel the summer wind and her sense of oneness with the world around her. The painting evokes a feeling of peace and happiness. She was painted with admiration and affection. Right. Thank you. Very, very nice, very nice. Thank you. Well, you all got an A on that assignment. That, that, was, that was very well done. You were able to transpose the information in the example to, the, your, to your assignment very well. Okay, we are, are about out of time, and this is the focus of the course, the heart of the course. So I think I've given you a gist of how we've translated the face-to-face -face, um, onto fully online. Are there any other questions or any questions? Well, I do get a lot of really great comments about this particular assignment and another assignment where they have to take a museum tour and then do the very same thing, apply it to an, another painting. No, they do it individually, right. I actually expected people to do it individually, but you guys did it as a group, which worked great. I've never thought of that. Great idea. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Right. So when I'm focusing on paintings in the text, I'm, and they've already read a section on using the elements of composition, I want them to name a minimum of maybe four specific elements. And I want them to be able to identify them correctly in those paintings. Directive questions like that? No, I never have. I, I just say identify four elements that your text just discussed in the Night Watchman. So then I'm asking them to translate that way. Oh, I'm glad you asked that question because this is a great advertisement for this. We offered one online section of humanities last year. This fall, we are offering five. So that, I mean, it's just been an incredible explosion. I think a lot of it has to do with the feature in Canvas where you can answer students using that media comment. They just love that and they respond very well to that. Very good. Excellent. Yeah. I have very few drops. I haven't yet, no. Well, you're more advanced than I <laughs> When I learn these things, and I will, yeah. Good idea. Great. How do you feel that you've uh, circumvented your concerns over copyright with these clips? Oh, um, I've checked with the person who is in charge of that, and they tell me how many minutes I can, how I can use. Somebody yes, that that's right. Exactly, okay. exactly. Oh, I've heard that, yeah. You can walk through the museum and choose the things that they want to talk about. Oh, art project. Yeah, but my question is, you know, you're using the film 